Hello, this is Neil Hansen. I'm one of the diagnostic radiologists at the University of Nebraska Medical Center presenting ultrasound part four, a lecture on ultrasound bioeffects and artifacts. I have no disclosures for this lecture. Again, I am not receiving any proceeds. This is for educational purposes. Everything presented within this lecture is obtained from free open source materials and is not being used for uh, publication. Uh, so here's a poll everywhere link. I put uh, questions in periodically into the lecture. You can go ahead and log into this on poll everywhere. These surveys help me to make my lectures better. Additionally, if you're one of my residents, I ask you to log in, fill out the survey with your real name so I can give you credit for having done the lecture. References, here's uh, some RSNA modules. The RSNA makes free physics modules designed for radiology residents. This one covers the modules interaction of tissue and ultrasound uh, Doppler and image quality artifacts and Doppler. This also has material which can be reviewed in the Huda textbook chapter 10 or the larger comprehensive medical physics textbook Bushberg chapter 14. We're going to cover bioeffects of ultrasound as well as go over artifacts, the physics of them and how to prevent them. Bioeffects, ultrasound, it feels good, right? If you've ever had an ultrasound transducer at a chiropractor office or a physical therapist office, it can make your sore muscles feel better, right? They uh, put the ultrasound transducer on your shoulder and uh, here's this Betty White lookalike, you know, it can help out a knotted muscle, whatever that means, or uh, relieve muscle spasm. Many athletes have them in their, uh, you know, training regimen uh, to keep them young forever. Uh, also, there's all sorts of like, I don't know, maybe scam companies out there which claim that ultrasound can like break up cellulite and make it look better, uh, you know. But there's a difference between uh, qualitative or uh, therapeutic uh, ultrasound probes and diagnostic ones. So a therapeutic ultrasound probe and transducer has a head, usually has uh, some tape and a water source over it uh, with a water cone around it. And I'll have you know that like these therapeutic ultrasound probes can induce tissue desiccation and heating and do tissue damage. So um, the power output from them, unlike diagnostic imaging, can actually have significant bio effects. Bio effects. So at high power levels, ultrasound can cause cavitation uh, via the creation and collapse of microscopic tiny bubbles. Uh, this is of special concern, especially with harmonic imaging due to high peak pressures that can be obtained. So a bubble can form, and then as you compress and rarefact, compress and rarefact, that bubble grows in successful, successive uh, cycles until it undergoes a violent collapse and can be heated uh, to very high degrees. You can use this experimentally. This is used to try and treat tumors and try and treat even uterine fibroids. Uh, however, you know, you would not want to be doing a therapeutic ultrasound and have this happen to someone's normal trapezius muscle. Uh, and again, like there's people, I'm not sure if this really works or not, not that I have tried it a lot on myself at home alone, but uh, the, uh, you know, to break up cellulite, break up these fat globules, make them look smoother. You know, I'm not really certain this works, but that's the theory behind it. Mechanical index. So the physics of ultrasound bioeffects. You have to understand something uh, in terms of the mechanical index. So the parameter of mechanical index estimates the chance of inducing cavitation under a given system with a given power output. It's proportional to the peak pressure values in the ultrasound beam and it causes tissue heating, right? That's the ultimate res result of these interactions, uh, tissue heating. And it's of special concern for spectral Doppler because the beam is really focused in one spot. A lot of people historically were worried about spectral Doppler imaging like six week old intrauterine uh, fetuses and embryos that you'd uh, introduce, induce like an iatrogenic miscarriage. Uh, that's really kind of been disproven. Uh, but that was of, uh, you know, with modern, I'll give that caveat. With modern ultrasound machines, up-to-date state-of-the-art imaging currently, that's not thought to be a real concern, but historically it, it has been for that reason. The thermal index. Uh, so the thermal index is a ratio of the acoustic power produced by the transducer to the power required to raise the tissue temp one degree Celsius. Uh, and again, this is like the theory behind like lipolysis and cellulite removal is that you can 
uh, raise tissue temps and cause it to cavitate and break down and realign. Um, if you'll notice, I'm preoccupied by the physics of cellulite removal for some reason. All right, uh, so the thermal index. So like if you have a thermal index of three, the tissue temperature could increase by three degrees Celsius for a stationary transducer. It's specific to individual tissue. So the tissue index depends on whether you're over bone, fat, muscle, etc. AIUM. So what is the AIUM? It's the American Institute for Ultrasound and Medicine. Uh, they have a nice meeting every year, so I'd encourage you to go. It monitor, monitors ultrasound safety with specific standards, and at commonly used diagnostic settings, no effects occur. For example, there are thousands of obstetrical ultrasounds per year done, probably millions overall, uh, with no reported side effects. HIFU is kind of what I uh, alluded to earlier in terms of therapeutic imaging. Uh, rather therapeutic ultrasound. HIFU stands for a high intensity focus ultrasound. It's where that focus ultrasound uh, is designed to be more powerful and cause tissue effects. It's currently accepted uh, in therapy for uterine fibroids and it's experimentally being used for you know very localized drug delivery. It's uh, been used to try and achieve uh, hemostasis, thrombolysis, directed percutaneous therapy of numerous tumors. So it's a it's an ongoing site of active research. Uh, here's an example of like fibroids or a liver tumor where you're positioning a person and then doing very targeted ultrasound therapy at uh, usually a mass lesion of some sort. Here's an experimental one. Uh, HIFU has been used to, to try and treat prostate uh, cancer, so using an endorectal ultrasound and really focused ultrasound beam targeted at uh, a, uh, a prostate cancer, for example. So, you know, volunteer for that one if you want, but I'm not signing up. All right, artifacts. So the only difference between the picture on the left hand of the screen and the right uh, and the echogenic area signified by the arrow is the adjustment of the focal zone. What was that artifact caused by? The correct answer is an object located outside the field of imaging. And I'll have you note that I got a lot of these figures off of a radiographics article based off of ultrasound uh, imaging artifacts which I would encourage you to uh, look up and read. It's an excellent article. Uh, has a lot of very useful things on it. So here's figure one. This is a diagram of an ultrasound beam. The main ultrasound beam narrows as it approaches the focal zone and then diverges, creating these grating lobes and side lobes uh, as a form of off-axis energy. So beam width artifact is a uh, another artifact here. And... Uh, or no, that's, I'm sorry, the beam with artifact is the name of the artifact uh, that was uh, shown in the prior question. So beam with artifact is where a strong reflector located outside of the main ultrasound beam generates echoes from scatter that are detectable from the transducer. It's commonly seen as peripheral echoes in fluid containing structures like a bladder or a gallbladder. And the way you fix it is to adjust the focal zone. So if you're shown two pictures and the only thing that you know change between them uh, is a focal zone change and the center of beam uh, is now placed over the object of interest and it's an artifact within a fluid filled structure you gotta think about beam width artifact all right take a look here at this image of the gallbladder and the artifact outlined by the arrows that apparent gallbladder sludge is actually what Yes, the natural response is to ask the technologist, what did you think? And then put that down. But I'll tell you, this is actually a side lobe artifact. So the piezoelectric crystals generate side lobe energy that's off the axis of the main beam due to radial expansion within the crystal itself. Usually this is seen in a linear transducer, uh, most commonly. 
And uh, a strong reflector that's outside the main beam creates echoes from the side waves or the side lobe waves. Usually it's seen as a linear echo in a fluid filled structure. So here this looks kind of like an echogenic line going through the gallbladder, which is of course a fluid filled structure. Uh, beam width artifacts in contradistinction are not linear. If you go back to that prior example, it looked like kind of more a focal blob. How do you fix this? Use a curved transducer, or you can also, just like beam width artifact, change your focal zone. Here's your next artifact. Yep, nervous Neil is what they called me first year in radiology, no. Um, so a nervous uh, first year uh, doing a biopsy is not what caused this. This was sound reflection. This is reverberation artifact. So in the presence of two highly parallel reflective surfaces, if you think about it, that's all a needle is, is you have a, uh, you know, a, a, a circle of a very reflective metallic surface usually, um, that has, you know, as beam goes, as sound goes through it, it encounters both the near portion of that circle and the far portion. Uh, and it uh, causes the sound beam to bounce around within it. And depending on how many times it bounced around within that uh, needle, that determines how many echoes are recorded and how far away that trail of artifactual signals gets propagated. The longer they bounce, the longer the delay until detected, and the farther away the transducer thinks they are. Comet tail artifact is a form of reverberation artifact where you can see comet tail artifact in a couple different uh, clinical scenarios. What causes the comet tail artifact in the gallbladder? Well, it's echogenic cholesterol uh, crystals. So we can actually use this artifact, this uh, reverberation artifact, to diagnose adenomyomatosis. It's where there's a gallbladder wall thickening secondary to an exaggeration of the normal luminal folds. It causes some smooth muscle proliferation, and uh, it's often seen in the setting of cholesterolosis. Uh, where these little echogenic cholesterol foci have comet tail artifact. It's only important to know so you don't mistake it for something else. It is a benign finding. All right, here's your next artifact. Take a look at this image. What is the frequent cause of this artifact? The correct answer is gas. So this is ring down artifact. So it's often confused with comet tail artifact, but it looks a little bit different. It's really a line or a series of band deep to the, the focus that's causing the artifact. It's caused by resonant vibrations of sound within the fluid that is uh, surrounded by air bubbles. And how do you use this? Well, most commonly it's used to find gas foci. Uh, so like if you saw a bunch of ring down artifact like in the gallbladder wall, you might be concerned that there was emphysematous cholecystitis. Ring down and dirty shadowing. So some people talk about dirty shadowing and clean shadowing. In real life, it can be very difficult to ascertain, but clean shadowing is associated with things like gallstones, where it's nearly black behind the echogenic structure, versus dirty shadowing can be more associated with gas, like here is a uh, uh, dirty shadowing within the endometrial cavity related to endometritis, where you have uh, kind of a more amorphous gray level of echogenicity deep to the echogenic foci. Here's your next picture for artifact. That artifact was caused by a highly reflective surface. And if you look at it, this is a mirror image artifact. It's where there's an echogenic mass, in this case it was probably a hemangioma, that appeared both within the liver and on the opposite side of the diaphragm. The diaphragm here is this uh, thick echogenic structure 
um, that causes uh, this artifact here. So commonly uh, where there's a highly reflective surface or interface, like between soft tissue and gas, for example, you'll get this mirror image artifact. It's based off of a false assumption that echoes return after a single reflection, when in reality some echoes back bounce back and forth at the reflector surface and the transducer then thinks they are farther away than they are, hence causing that mirror image. We covered this in a prior uh, talk. What is this artifact? That's where uh, there's like focal fat in the liver, gas travel or uh, sound travels slower through fat than it does liver parenchyma. And, uh, but the ultrasound beam assumes all that goes travel at 1540 meters per second. So that causes the uh, displacement artifact. So if the echoes go through that focal fat where the sound is slower than soft tissue, then the delay of the echo return is interpreted falsely by the computer as that echo coming from farther away. For example, here displacing it slightly off of where the normal uh, diaphragm should be. That's displacement artifact. All right, what is that artifact and what can it be mathematically represented by? That is Snell's law. So Snell's law uh, is just a measurement or a way to measure refraction artifact. <clears throat> this occurs at an interface of materials where sound travels differently at different speeds. At that interface, the ultrasound beam changes in direction and the proportion of that velocity change um, and the angle of incidence determines uh, you know, how off axis that refraction uh, ends up in. Echoes appear to the side of the actual location or appear duplicated and frequently this is seen in like deep structures in the pelvis uh, as a common site for refraction artifact. So if you look here you know uh, an example of this would be like a cyst and uh, you know a nodule that's going through that you're imaging through a cyst or something in the pelvis, like I said before, that you're imaging through the bladder. It's caused by sound passing into a medium of a different propagation speed. So you're going through soft tissue, then you're going through pure fluid in the bladder or assist, then you're seeing a nodule, and because of that differential change in speeds, the actual position of the nodule is a little off axis uh, compared to where it's being displayed. Same thing would, can happen if you're looking through uh, like say looking for the aorta and there's differential amounts of muscle for example like the rectus abdominal muscle uh, is of varying widths and it's different in terms of how fast sand can go through it sound can go through it uh, compared to like fat so if you have no muscle here like where the linea alba is and you have a lot of muscle here maybe you know i do eight minute abs every day is that even still a thing eight minute abs it was back when i exercised but uh it can cause this uh, artifact all right here's your next artifact What is that gallstone artifact caused by? The correct answer is attenuation. So shadowing. So when a beam encounters a strongly attenuating material, i.e. calcium or metal, the echoes received from the points deep to it are significantly less intense to the absorbed uh, due to absorption and uh, attenuation. So if you have a strong attenuator like uh, a calcified gallstone, then everything behind it or deep to it is going to look dark because there's really no sound being propagated through it. Uh, this results in a dark hypochoic band deep to it, and oftentimes uh, this shadowing is called clean shadowing versus the dirty shadowing of gas that I kind of discussed earlier. Here's an example here. It can be difficult, if not impossible, to tell these apart. But on the right-hand image, you have the classic wall, echo, shadow, 
clean shadow of gallstones versus here you have emphysematous cholecystitis where you have an echogenic structure. You have no wall echo shadow complex and it's very dirty shadowing behind the gas. Here's an example where maybe it's kind of hard to tell and uh, it's like, uh, I'm not sure. So what you would do in that situation is get either a plain film or a CT scan to see if you could differentiate. Here is the next artifact. The correct answer there is increased through transmission. So uh, when you have something that's filled with fluid like a cyst or the bladder, when the ultrasound beam encounters a focal weakly attenuating structure, like one of those structures, the beam intensity deep to it is greater than the same uh, intensity or the same location adjacent to it in the rest of the field. So this is used to confirm something is cystic. So what do you have to have to call something a cyst? You have to have four or five things. You have to have an anechoic structure, well-defined, thin, imperceptible border, no flow within it, and increase through transmission, right? So that increase through transmission can be diagnostically useful. So here's an example of a uh, two abnormalities. One is a breast cancer. One is a cyst. They look fairly similar, but behind this, you have increased through transmission. Behind this, you have dirty shadowing. Cancer, bad. Cyst, not so bad. All right, here's the next artifact. That is caused by increasing, or you can fix that by increasing the PRF. So that is aliasing. So again, you get a uh, kind of a green-yellow appearance within a color Doppler image. Also, you get images uh, on the spectral analysis where the waveform wraps around. So instead of being at the tall peak, because you didn't sample fast enough to see that velocity, it gets wrapped around to the bottom. This results from very high velocity flow. The velocity becomes so high that the transducer can't sample it fast enough and interpret some of the signal as actually being reversed, hence being below the baseline in that spectral analysis. How do you fix that? Increase your pulse repetition frequency. Again, the PRF should be at least two times the highest Doppler frequency shift to get an adequate image and avoid aliasing artifact. Here's an example of twinkle artifact. Uh, this is a renal stone so uh, using color or doppler you can look for twinkle and actually diagnose nephrolithiasis twinkle artifact is an intrinsic machine noise seen on color doppler ultrasound it's associated with reflective objects like renal calculi and it really depends on a rough reflective surface a non-specular reflector it's much more sensitive for small stones than shadowing although frequently i'll see an area of twinkle and you won't see an echogenic stone and about half the time that's just an artifact you don't see a stone when you do a follow-up ct so i kind of ignore this uh, clinically a lot of times it's not very specific with a very high false positive rate so that concludes the ultrasound lectures thank you for participating along